chapter 12, verse 27, when he wrote, Now you are the body of Christ and the members of individual. We quote that verse a lot in the context of pointing out that the church is the body of Christ, and therefore Jesus is the head, there is one body, of course, and that we are not qualified to make up our own rules or our own practices for the church any more than our bodies are allowed to make up their own minds about things without consulting the head. That's very true. But I think we get to that point when we quote this passage or when we read this passage. About halfway through, we made the point that we want to make. And so it reads something like this. Now you are the body of Christ and members of the church. Something like that. We don't, by the time we get to that part, we're done. We don't emphasize the individual mandate of this passage that often. But we should, because what this passage tells us, and many other passages tell us, that we, both as a church corporately and as individual members, are responsible as the body of Christ for doing those things on this earth that Jesus would do if he were present with us in the flesh, if he were physically here. And so those characteristics that we've identified in the body of Christ this morning, as well as other characteristics that the body of Christ had to be, I do not mean this list to be all just those characteristics of Christ should be characteristics of his body today. Purity should be a characteristic of the body of Christ and of the members of the body of Christ. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, Paul writes, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. He said, if your bodies are living sacrifices, you are living sacrifices, holy. Holy means set apart. Set aside for a special purpose. Many people today will be having an Easter dinner with some china or silver that is, in a sense, holy. That is, it's, it's set aside for a special purpose. You put a slice of pizza on that china and there are going to be problems in that house. Yes, it's set aside. And Paul says that you are to be sacrificed, living sacrifices, set aside for the purpose of the will of God. And that setting aside, that holiness, is the same thing as purity. Setting aside from the purposes of worldly activity for the purpose of serving God. So the body of Christ today, members of it, should be pure as Christ was pure. The body of Christ should exhibit the same sacrificial life, the same selflessness with which Jesus served when he was on this earth. In Philippians chapter 2, Beginning in verses 2 through 4, right before the passage, the famous passage that I read a few moments ago, Paul writes, Fulfill my joy by being like minded, having the same love, being of one accord, one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not, look not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Paul said, Don't selfish. Don't think about yourself. Look out for other people. Put other people's interests ahead of your own. That's the sacrificial life. Not just the sacrificial death, but the sacrificial life that we see in the body of Christ when it was on earth. It should be present in the body of Christ today. The body of Christ should act for the welfare of others, more so than it acts for the welfare of itself. As Jesus was an instrument of action, so also the body of Christ today should be active. 1 Peter 2, verse 15, Peter wrote, For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Doing good serves a number of purposes, doesn't it? In the first place, it improves the lives of the people that we serve. If we have any idea of what good is, then we make people's lives better, both spiritually, but also materially, by doing good. Doing good makes our lives better. Things that we do may seem to be sacrifices when we do them, but many times you'll look back on something that you did because it was the right thing that you didn't want to do necessarily, and you say, well, you know what? I'm better off 
for doing that, that I would have been if I had done what I really wanted to do. And doing good also serves to silence critics, as Peter mentioned in this passage. A lot of charges have been leveled against the church over the centuries. There were charges being leveled in the first century and in the subsequent centuries that had a lot to do with misunderstandings of what the church did, or what it said, or what it taught. <coughs> there are charges being leveled at the church today. And one of the things that happened in old times was that those charges eventually began to look suspect. When people looked at the church, looked at the lives of Christians and the things they did, they saw that those, their lives were not consistent with the accusations being leveled against them. Today, one of the accusations that is liable to be hurled at us, especially if the subject of homosexuality comes up and Christians, as God teaches, proclaim that to be immoral, the charge that gets leveled is hatred. Well, you're just, you just hate. You're just engaging in hate speech and hateful activity. And there's nothing we can do to keep people from saying that. And <coughs> that's generally not firm ground for reasoning with them. But if they are open-minded or capable of being open-minded, they're ready to look at us honestly. Eventually, they should see in our lives evidence that, that, is, that what we do in our everyday lives is not consistent with the <coughs> against us if we truly live as we're truly active in doing good, as Peter said, <coughs> and we should also be willing to act as Jesus did with courage, being willing to face those charges without backing down, without changing what we do, if what we're doing is according to the will of God, and to be willing to lose many of those things, those earthly things with which God has blessed us, and even our very lives, if necessary. Courage, action and action with courage should typify the body of Christ. And the passage that we heard at the earlier in the service in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 26, Paul said, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Now there's many people in the religious world who will take communion today or maybe the only time during or perhaps one of a few times a year. And I would ask them, is the proclamation of the Lord's death something that we ought to do just once or twice a year? Is proclaiming the Lord's death something that we ought to do as the first century church did under the direction of the apostles every time we come together on the first day of the week? And I would ask all of us who do take the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week, is proclaiming the Lord's death something that we ought to do confined to that observance of the communion? Or should we be daily in the business of proclaiming the Lord's death, not by taking the communion service, the bread and the fruit of vine, but by being and living memorial of Christ? When we commemorate the body of Christ in the Lord's Supper, we don't, we don't just remember it, but we commit to be the body of Christ. Remind ourselves that that body was here, how it acted, and what we should do now as the body of Christ on earth. Remind ourselves to be a living woman, to, with our actions, with our words, and our demeanor, bring to memory Christ in the minds of all the people that we encounter in our daily lives. That the, the body of Christ, the suffering of the body of Christ, and the blood of Christ is not a once a year subject, or even once a week subject the daily, hour by hour, subject for the lives of those of us who are the members of the body of Christ. Christ, through his body, brought salvation to us. And we, as his body, take salvation to those who have not heard it, do not know it. But before we do that, we obviously need to have it ourselves. We need to claim that salvation that, that the body of Christ, the blood of Christ, has made available to us by obeying the gospel what we like to call the plan of salvation, those things that God has told us through his word that we can do and by which we can know that we have been saved. Believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God is in Mark chapter 16, and thereby believing that he is the Son of God, believing that he has the authority to tell us the 
the circumstances under which we can be saved. Repenting of our sins, as in Acts chapter 2. Confessing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God before men, as mentioned in Romans chapter 10. And finally being immersed in the waters of baptism, as in Romans 6 and in Acts chapter 2 again. Then living a new life, also in Romans chapter 6. A life that's different from the life that we led before. A life in which we are not our own body, but a member of the body of Christ. If you have not done those things, then according to Acts chapter 2, verse 47, God has not added you to the body of Christ. He's not adding you to that body of the saved. If you have done those things, you are a Christian, but you have not been acting like the body of Christ. You have been doing those things according to your own body, rather than according to what the body of Christ should be doing. Then there will never be in your life be a better opportunity to make that right in the day. And if you have sinned in a way that is public, and you need to publicly come forward and repudiate the things that you have done so that everyone knows that you acknowledge those things are contrary to the Word of God, and you have that opportunity as well, if you simply want the prayers and encouragements of your brothers and sisters in Christ through your daily struggle as a Christian, then you have that opportunity.